Valentina here again and I've noticed that one of the most watched videos on my channel is a video about um, having relationships with people in the cluster B personality disorder. So those are antisocial personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder. And it seems like a lot of people are interested in um, sociopaths and psychopaths and narcissists trying to figure out um, who they are, how they operate, and possibly suspecting that their partners have some of these characteristics or other people that they know, family members or co-workers have some of these characteristics, especially about um, people that are considered sociopaths and psychopaths and often there's a lot of confusion about the two and what's the difference between the two and I think on top of that is um, maybe some people have heard about the psychopath psychopathy checklist um, and trying to figure out uh, maybe hey I have certain characteristics am I diagnosable and oh my god is that terrible first of all if you're thinking that much about yourself and you're that self-reflective and considering your behavior you're not likely to fall into those categories you might but probably not <laughs> So today I wanted to kind of unravel some of that information and perhaps give you more information so you get a better idea of what's being talked about when you hear things and you're a little more clear and perhaps see things a little better and uh, maybe more generous in your interpretations of the behaviors and characteristics of others, right? <laughs> we don't want to put people in little boxes that they don't exactly fit correctly, but then treat them like they do, right? So, all right, first of all, there are two things. There, there is the DSM, um, the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual, that often psychologists use and therapists use to diagnose antisocial personality disorder. And then there's the Robert Haar's uh, um, psychopathy checklist, um, and now it's been revised, it was revised, um, and it's uh, a little bit more precise and focused tool for diagnosing really bad people. And what I mean by that, it's mainly used in criminology to diagnose, um, obviously, criminals. Robert Haar is a psychologist from Canada who is a criminal psychologist and came up with this checklist to help people figure things out. So we're going to talk a little bit about both. Um, first, I'll start with the checklist. The psychopathy checklist covers 20 different traits and scores them on a three-point scale. The, uh, either zero, one, or two. In, so if there's a characteristic, let's say like callousness, uh, you can, the person can be zero, like they don't exhibit that um, trait. One, they exhibit some of that trait. Or two, a reasonable... Um, reasonably good representation of that trait in the person. So we score 20 traits on a three point scale. The maximum points you can get is 40. In order to be diagnosed as a psychopath in America, you have to score 30 or above. In the UK, it's 26 or 25 and above. So that's a lot of characteristics that you have to have, embody, and to a high degree in order to score that high to actually be certifiable psychopath. <laughs> so let's look at these characteristics. I have a whole, the whole list because 20 of them, I don't want to miss anything, right? So um, very impulsive aggressive, 
lack of empathy and callous, glib and superficial charm, grandiose estimations of self or very, very exaggerated estimations of self, need for stimulation, constant need for stimulation, they're pathological liars, they're cunning and manipulative, lack of remorse or guilt, shallow emotional effect, meaning they don't feel emotions the same as the rest of the world does. And there are a lot of studies on that, looking into the brains of these people to see what parts of the brains light up under certain circumstances. And literally, they don't light up. <laughs> so, it's for real. Uh, they have a parasitic lifestyle. This means they take advantage of others regularly, freely. Uh, they're sexually promiscuous. They have early, so childhood behavior problems. Um, lack of re realistic goals for themselves. Poor behavior controls. Slightly different than being impulsive. Impulsive is about making decisions and behavior control is about what you're doing in the moment. So like, you know, let's say somebody's talking, telling a story and you decide you'll just get naked and play with yourself. <laughs> know, that's kind of extreme, but <laughs> it happens. <laughs> All right. Um, so they are, irres they, another trait is irresponsibility. Also, Failure to accept responsibility for past actions. So responsibility, irresponsibility is like now for the future and failure to take responsibility for past actions. Um, they have many short-term intimate relationships. So they might have been married a few times for short periods of times or just have um, live-in partners just cycling through them fast. One year, two years, six months three years, like really short-term relationships. Um, and then, especially for criminals, looking at their record, you can see very frequent revocation of conditional release. So the judges will revoke their conditional release. Um, uh, you know, obviously for those who have record and those who don't, you can't put that in there. So again, this uh, 20 traits need to be scored on a three-point scale in America. You have to get 30 points or more to be certified or diagnosed <laughs> as a psychopath, according to the uh, psychopathy checklist devised by Robert Hare. You can look that up if you like and learn more about it. Again, it's mostly used in criminal uh, cases. Um, and a lot of the research was also done on uh, inmates to see how they respond to treatment. There's actually a good video out there. I'm going to look it up and put it in the uh, description section below about uh, this particular, um, some of this research and um, studies and, and just following specific criminals in England and I can't remember from the top of my head what it was I wish I had thought about that before I started the video I would have been more prepared but it just popped into my mind that I seen this um, some time ago so I'll look it up and put it in the description below so you can watch this documentary and learn more about the kinds of research and the severity of the disorder and where the thinking is in terms of uh, rehabilitation rehabilitability if at all possible and options for that right so um, in this particular um, system or checklist they divide the behaviors into sort of two categories the first category captures traits that have to do with interpersonal behavior so things like lack of empathy, lack of remorse, um, shallow emotional effect, 
fall into that factor one category of traits and in factor two category of traits we see more of the antisocial behavioral issues like um, criminal versatility um, like juvenile delinquency so more kind of a socially problematic behavior societally problematic behavior rather than uh, just interpersonal problematic behavior all right so how does this all differ from the dsm's checklist so the dsm diagnostic criteria for antisocial personality disorder under which we see sociopathic and um, 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 psychopathic <laughs> sorry <laughs> a glitch there <laughs> sociopaths and psychopaths described by the dsm and and also what's the difference between the two so like we say sociopaths have a problematic consciousness so that means they have a little bit of conscience right while psychopaths don't have a conscience <laughs> so that's the difference like one is more severe than the other so the dsm uh there are uh, so the 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 criteria for antisocial personality disorder is a there is a pervasive pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others occurring since the age of 15 as indicated by three or more of the following one failure to conform to social norms with respect to lawful behaviors as indicated by repeatedly performing acts that are grounds for arrest two Deceitfulness as indicated by repeated lying, use of aliases, or cunning others for personal profit or pleasure. Three, impulsivity or failure to plan ahead. Four, irritability and aggressiveness as indicated by repeated physical fights or assaults. Five, Reckless disregard for safety of self and others. Six, consistent irresponsibility as indicated by repeated failure to sustain consistent work behavior or honor financial obligations. Seven, lack of remorse as indicated by being indifferent or to rationalizing having hurt, mistreated, or stolen from another. B, the individual is at least 18 years old. C, there is evidence of conduct disorder with onset before the age of 15. So again, early childhood behavior problems. D, occurrence of antisocial behavior is not exclusive, um, exclusively during the course of schizophrenia or manic episodes. So, some similarities between the DSM and the psycho psychopathy checklist. Clearly, the psychopathy checklist is more extensive, more precise tool than the DSM. Yes, a lot of us exhibit one or two or three of some of these traits probably to a much lower degree than it would be clinically um, a threshold. The interesting thing is that, um, for example, majority of criminals will easily fit within the antisocial personality disorder uh, framework, right? Majority of the criminals. In fact, the statistics are 80 to 85 percent of inmates easily fit within the antisocial personality disorder. However, according to Robert Hare, only 20 percent of them can actually be diagnosed as psychopaths. So it's a much smaller portion of the criminal population. 
And we don't know what it's like outside of the walls of a prison because um, for someone to get diagnosed as a psychopath, they have to be get they have to get caught doing something and have to end up somewhere in the system where the diagnosis becomes important. Um, there are plenty of people who have these traits or perhaps are very functional psychopaths. You might think of um, let's say, um, high-ranking CEOs that are very cunning and cruel and they seem to be defying justice in many ways. Some of them get caught, like Medoff and some other people. And then later, um, lately, in our political environment, we're seeing people going to jail constantly for very interesting things, right? So maybe some of these people are diagnosable because <laughs> they have blatant disregard for the feelings or the well-being of others. <laughs> and they're prone to criminal behavior and rationalizing their actions, correct? <laughs> Irresponsible, they don't accept responsibility for past actions. Anyways, uh, without getting political here, going back to the 20% that are diagnosable as psychopaths according to the Robert Hare's psychopathy checklist, um, these 20% are responsible for over 50% of the most violent and crazy crimes out there. So they're big troublemakers. They're small amount of people that are huge troublemakers. And um, half, of the, uh, half of all serial killers and repeated rapists have been officially diagnosed as psychopaths. So before you decide to label your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend a psychopath, you want to consider the severity of your claim. <laughs> oh, maybe they don't have enough empathy. Maybe they don't care about you as much as you like to. Some of that is your own subjective judgment. And I will definitely counsel you not to hang around with people that are irresponsible financially or otherwise that show repeatedly that they don't care about your feelings or that they are selfish, manipulative, and um, Machiavellian. Obviously, those are not good people to be in a relationship with whether or not they're diagnosable either under the DSM or under the psychopathy checklist. So hopefully this gives you a better idea of what's going on out there because uh, those terms are used frequently and freely. A lot of, um, um, you know, like narcissistic behavior um, ends up almost synonymous with psychopathic behavior like we're throwing these terms out there willy-nilly very imprecisely but it's it's every one of those things is a judgment statement really and while a judgment statement can be an accurate representation of reality and therefore a good way to uh, protect yourself or pay attention to what's going on often it's just a little exaggerated unfair and also uh, biased right um, so Hopefully this is helpful to a lot of you and please uh, comment below if uh, you know people like this or, or about your own experiences. I would love to hear from others um, and, and if you like this content, please hit the like button, like. <laughs> it helps Google know that this is good content and will spread it around to others who want to hear it or are searching for it. Um, subscribe to my channel, the little red button below. And by subscribing to my channel, um, you will get all future videos delivered to your email if you designate that as your notification option. And that's all I have for today, trying to keep it a little short. Hopefully it was helpful and take care. Valentina Petrova here, Valentina Petrova Consulting.